and God decided to make a running back. He made Ricky Williams. Oscar Ricky Williams got an alley and explodes into it. Look, I got great speed. It was amazing to watch. He never, ever let you down. Pulls his way in, touchdown, and the records start to fall. An icon, a leader, uh, somebody to rally around, an identity. He, he was all of those things for us. And the crowd is yelling, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. And get chills talking about it. He's unbelievable. Williams breaks a hole. Williams, hello, record book. 97 was a uh, was an interesting year. Um, the the program had a had a rough spot. We were four and seven. It's interesting because you know I was running for 200 yards almost every week, and we were losing. It seems like three or four teams tore down goalposts that year after beating us. And the most memorable one for me was probably the Baylor game. It's kind of when our bull hopes started to be flushed down the drain. It's kind of a disaster. My thoughts of going to the NFL didn't really start until um, rumors were going around about Coach McEvick losing his job. Those rumors ended on November 29th, 1997. But when Texas fired John McEvick, it only gave birth to 41 more days of innuendo and indecision. Would Ricky Williams run down and over history or to the riches of the NFL? He had just led the nation in rushing, bettered Earl's best season, and finished fifth in voting for the Heisman. He was widely known as one of the best backs in college football, but now faced an unknown in the form of a stranger arriving from North Carolina. The last time Texas was number one in football, 13 long years ago, the Longhorns were tied by a number two Oklahoma team whose offense was coordinated by Mack Brown, the same Mack Brown who's now the new sheriff in Austin. When we came into Texas in December of 97 for the 98 season, uh, we had a team meeting the night I got here. And it's a real emotional time because you've just left your team at North Carolina. You run to see this team and they're four and seven. They're, they're struggling. They have got beat by A&M and, and they haven't even been together since Thanksgiving. So they're out of shape. And Sally came in and said, what are you doing? You left the number four team in the country to, to come here. I sat on the side of the meeting room, I was on the edge, so if I had to escape, it was a quick, quick, easy exit. I didn't want to give him the impression that I liked him or that I was going to support him or help him at all, and so I, I'm sure part of it was, was making my message uh, obvious to him. He sat in the back of the first meeting. I could see him in the back, and then as soon as the meeting was over, he got up and left and didn't speak, didn't say hello to anybody. So we figured that he was probably going to the NFL. I was at work and I received a call from the football office. They wanted to meet me and see what my feelings were like. So during that meeting, one of the things that Coach Brown said that Ricky would have to cut his hair. I was like, there's no way Ricky's cutting his hair. And I remember calling Ricky on my way back to work. And I'm like, oh, you're not staying. You're out of there. I'm not sure if he called the meeting or I called the meeting, but that we had a meeting. He didn't bring me in trying to recruit me, or it wasn't obvious. He was bringing me in to try to gather some information. And so he started asking me about my opinion about the team. And it was the first time uh, in my career, maybe even in my life, that an authority figure or an adult actually asked my opinion. He had some concerns about winning. He had some concerns about discipline. He had concerns about whether I would let him wear his dreadlocks or not. And then uh, I still thought he would probably leave. Uh, and he said, Coach, look inside. Don't, don't look at just the hair. The hair issue was a big issue. At that time, there weren't a lot of players that had dreads. And if they did, there were expectations, mostly wrong, about what type of person that was. I mean, it's not the hair. The deal breaker was, you know, accept me as I am or I can go do something else. Sometimes they change the rules for you. And to me, that's, that's one of the advantages of being, of being great, is you get to do what you want. When you have those kind of skills, I mean, Mac is a very intelligent coach. You know, hair or skills, what's going to win out? A couple of days later, I was in sports information director's office and flipping through uh, college football um, sports almanac. And at this point, I wasn't aware how close I was to breaking 
the all-time rushing record. I think I was only 1,900 yards behind Tony Dorsett. And if I had a similar season as I had my junior year, I would own this record. And I was like, wow, this record is, has been here since before I was born. And then I came across the touchdown record, and I was like, wow, I could have that one too. And then I even came across the all-purpose yards record, and I was like, wow, I could break all three of these records. Of those, Tony Dorsett's was most notable. His 6,082 rushing yards at Pitt were as elusive as Ricky's were punishing. Dorsett also set the bar for drama. In 1976, he broke the previous record on a 32-yard touchdown and then won the Heisman. Tony Dorsett has become the all-time leading rusher in the history of football, and this is the only way Tony Dorsett wanted it. But breaking the record held by Napoleon McCallum seemed more improbable. In 1985, McCallum ended his career with 7,172 all-purpose yards, a number bolstered by his role as Navy's kick and punt returner, two roles that Ricky would never fill. The longevity of those records hinged on a decision yet to be made. There was rumors back and forth. I remember the week or two leading up to that. Nobody really knew what he was gonna do. Uh, it was all up in the air, and I think, you know, that's kind of the way he wanted it. He wanted a little in intrigue behind it. He didn't talk to anyone about it. Matter of fact, no one saw Ricky. <laughs> and, you know, the next time I saw him, you know, he was on TV with Mac. When I came here uh, three years ago, I set personal goals and, and goals for the team that, that I thought we could achieve and things I thought we could do, you know, to win a lot of games, to, to put Texas back on the map, and, and personally to do some things, you know, maybe win the Heisman or, or maybe just, just help the team win a lot. And, and that was extremely important to me. I also wanted to, to get my degree from the University of Texas and, and, and that's why I'm gonna stay here one more year. Oh, I was elated. I mean, I was really excited. I mean, when Max spoke, I mean, he pumped us up. I mean, he, taught, he had this talk, you know? We have just had a successful recruiting class. <laughs> Our first signee just happens to be what I feel like may be the best player in college football that will re be returning for next year. It was definitely the sense was a dawning of a new era. It's exactly what I was asking for when I came to the university. In that moment, I, I could tell and I could feel that something was going to be different, that something was going to change. I was on my way home after the press conference and my cell phone rings, it's Ricky, and he says, hey mom, He's like, what are you doing? Where are you? And I said, on my way home, what's up? He said, you have 20 bucks I can borrow. And I just laughed, because you know, here you just turned down the opportunity to go into the NFL draft and, you know, potentially make millions. That night was, was kind of a bit of a celebration. Uh, I went downtown that night to, uh, to, a, to a club that I usually go to. And it's more of an upscale place. Uh, next thing I knew, I was sitting in VIP uh, sipping on champagne with total strangers, <laughs> and I loved it. Ricky was returning to Texas and his old number, from 11 to 34, the same number he wore in high school. That change was easy. The next one would be more difficult. So when a new coach comes in, he, he gets to hear the information from the people who are trying to maintain their job. And so everyone becomes a little tattletale. And so he was given information about, you know, my tardiness. And so it started to become an issue. Ricky gets to a plane, the airport, was right before the plane takes off. Yeah, Ricky's had a problem with being um, on time. So it's my first meeting with uh, Ricky Williams. My meeting with Ricky is at 11. 11.30, no Ricky. You know, 12 o'clock know Ricky and I'm really starting to get a little bit upset. One of the things that I'm supposed to talk to him about is being on time. He'd been late to the first two meetings so I brought he and Coach Chambers, our new running back coach in. I said okay you're selling all the season tickets Ricky. Fans are all pumped about you coming back uh, so there's not a lot we can do to you but uh, Coach Chambers if he's late again I'm gonna fire you. Ricky says uh, is he serious? And I said, yeah, he's serious. You heard him, didn't you? I think I was only late one time the whole year, which is much better than, than my track record. Ricky was still the centerpiece of the Texas program, but he was not the timepiece. Coaches no longer went by Ricky's clock or by his preferred rules of engagement. 
During that spring, we kind of had a no-hit Ricky Wu. Uh, but he used to go hit other people. And I used to have to talk to him about that. It wasn't necessarily a no-hit rule, but I, I love to practice and I love and I love the contact. And so a couple times, you know, in practice we'd butt head when I was ready to, to hop in there and he would have to literally grab me and say no. There was no hitting him. He might as well have been a quarterback. I mean, nobody was gonna hit Ricky and get away with it. Uh, I think there was one guy that, uh, that that tried to tackle him full speed and you know he's in a he's in a ditch buried somewhere now, but <laughs> Uh, no, he was not full contact at all. Ricky would get his chance for contact soon enough. But first, he would have to sacrifice one dream for another. In the summer of 1998, Ricky Williams was stuck between history and a bus ride to another cramped minor league park. The distance and disconnect from his Texas teammates troubled Ricky until one July morning, he woke up and decided to leave single-A baseball for Austin. He rejoined teammates in time for a grueling summer conditioning program. Unfortunately for New Mexico State, Ricky's final four weeks of minor league baseball didn't satisfy his thirst for contact. Ricky was ready to run. I think it's fair to say that, you know, when we look at this game on the map, that it was pretty much a W. The game plan was to kind of roll me out, to give me the ball a bunch, and also, you know, to see what our to see what our team is about. And a game like New Mexico State is a good way to get some of those questions answered. Williams looking for daylight, got it, touchdown Texas. Ricky Williams pulls his way in, touchdown. Well, five touchdowns is certainly going to catch the Heisman voters' attention. Williams got it again. And the records start to fall. All you had to do was just let the tape run. Every play was a highlight. For me, my whole thing was, I don't want to mess this guy up. I kind of felt like I was his personal valet. I just want to get him to the bus. Let's just get him to the field. One game in, and two major statements were crystal clear. Mac Brown would lean on Ricky, and Ricky was ready for the load. And 36 carries, Ricky rushed for 215 yards, the most ever by a Texas player in Austin, and six touchdowns, a single game record. It didn't look easy, it was easy. Going up against players at lesser schools like that was not gonna be a problem for Ricky Williams, and it was basically unfair for the opponent. It also heightened expectations about what he could possibly go on to accomplish um, uh, for the rest of the year. I don't know if it was that everyone was intimidated or if I just was in, you know, such amazing shape, but everything seemed to be really easy. Everybody's feeling pretty good. That season is gonna be better than, obviously, what it was the year before. The low point of the previous year, a 66-3 home loss to UCLA. Cade McNown was close to flawless with a school record five touchdowns. Ricky was flustered with 36 yards. Both were back as early season Heisman favorites, but the Bruins were favored to do something even bigger. They ended up, I think, winning every game since they beat us, and so they were one of the top three schools in the nation, and so we knew we had a challenge. We go out to UCLA, and Richard Walton, the starting quarterback, breaks his finger. Walton looking at his hand, apparently on that previous pass to Cavill, he must have hit it on his follow through, maybe on somebody's helmet. You know, I'm watching him shake his hand, and I'm like, you know, is he going to shake it off? Is it, is it jam? Is it, you know, what's going on? At that point, you know, now everybody's screaming and panicking, and hey, go in, go in, go in. You're like, I got it. You know, I understand. If he's not playing, I'm playing. So you just go in and, you know, start handing the ball off to Ricky. I'm talking to Ricky, and I say, listen, you need to take care of him. And he said, I will. Thank goodness, you know, for, for a young person in that situation, you had Ricky, you know, somebody to, to lean on. Even with the trio of fourth quarter touchdowns from Ricky, UCLA was 18 points better. With 160 yards, the box score showed that Ricky was good. The Texas record books proved he was great. On his first carry of the third quarter, Ricky broke Earl Campbell's school record for career rushing yards. He had just caught and passed one Heisman winner while losing ground on a contender at the same time. When the Longhorns lost to UCLA, it hurt Ricky's chances from the standpoint that Cade McNown jumped up because he was the winning quarterback in that game. And he too 
was one of the heavy favorites for the Heisman Trophy that year. All the media outlets were saying there went Ricky Williams' chances for the Heisman. I let it bother me so much, I ended up in the emergency room from a panic attack, which I thought was a heart attack. So after that game, it was a very rough week. This could be the toughest test for Ricky, especially because Richard Walton's injured. UCLA beat Texas by 18. Kansas State's coming out smoking and trying to beat them more to prove a point. Kansas State big time over Texas. Kansas State, you know, they had great defense. Uh, but it was apparent that those people that decided that, you know, we're going to put more people up here than, than they can block, and, and we're not going to let Ricky Williams beat us. I think, you know, like most defenses, those guys took it personal on that side. Well, I think we were a pretty good defensive football team at the, at the time, and I think there, there is a motivational factor playing against a, a Heisman contender at that time. They just had an incredible defense. I mean, I think they had seven or eight guys from that, from that team end up in the NFL, and they just got after us. It seemed like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Kansas State finished with 48 points. Ricky finished with 43 yards his lowest total since the 97 matchup against UCLA. They held him to under 100 yards, and some of us began to wonder, oh, what kind of a year is Ricky gonna have after all? All of the reports were Ricky's out of the Heisman. He has no chance anymore. I think his attitude was, you know, I'm sure at that time is why did I come back? You know, this isn't what I came back for. I took it hard. It was a, it was a rough, it was a rough game, not only losing, but just playing so, playing so poorly. I remember, I got home and, and I just was kind of trying to get out of the funk and I went to Blockbuster and I rented Blazing Saddles and I just went home and plopped down on the beanbag and watched the movie and, and just kind of laughed, laughed all of it out. And uh, the next day I was, uh, was ready to get back to work and get prepared for the next game. I'll never forget, I met Matthew McConaughey the week of the Rice game for the first time, and I asked Matthew to speak to the team because I remembered that uh, he had the great movie, A Time to Kill, and I thought at one and two at Texas, it's a time to kill somebody. I'm sure he, he won some brownie points with us bringing in Matthew McConaughey and actually having him talk to us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always nice when, you know, when things aren't going so well to, to do something to change it up a little bit. And I remember, you know, him coming and talking to us started to add at least a little bit of levity to the situation and allowed us to relax a little bit. He's gone. 10, 5, touchdown, Ricky Williams. He's still in his feet at the 5. Touchdown, Texas Williams once again. Ho-hum, six touchdowns and 318 yards rushing. Great effort by a back who's going to jump up today right back into that Heisman Trophy race. Picked our spirits up and gave us a boost of confidence, especially on the offensive side of the ball because we were able to move the ball well. Ricky had a great day, and you come out with a win, kind of just projected us into the next game. The 59-21 to 21 win was the turning point for a program and a senior season. But as soon as Ricky ran for daylight, the loss of a friend clouded his future. Sad news from the world of football today. Doak Walker, who won the 1948 Heisman Trophy and two NFL championships in his career, is dead. Walker died from complications from a skiing accident that left him paralyzed this past winter. Doak Walker was 71 years old. In 1997, Ricky Williams led college football in rushing, earning him the Doak Walker Award as the nation's best back. It also led to a deep bond with the namesake of that award. But a day after Ricky's career performance against Rice, Doak Walker died. Ricky dedicated the rest of the season to his friend. The first time I met him, um, I was in Orlando my junior year um, for the Home Depot College Football Awards. You know, I was used to kind of, you know, sensing people's curiosity or, or people's judgments. When I sat and talked to Doak, I didn't sense anything. You know, to him, I just was a, a kid, just was a football player. Here is a black kid from Southern California, wearing dreadlocks, embracing a white running back from the first half of the century, who was beloved by people who grew up around college football when it was virtually all white. That broke down whatever stereotype people had about Ricky Williams in their mind, which was wrong to begin with. There were a lot of players during that era who when Doak Walker passed away, they didn't even know anything about him. But Williams had taken the time to look up the records 
and study what Doak Walker accomplished at SMU and later with the Detroit Lions. He was someone that I admired for not only the way he played the game, but the way he carried himself off the field and just how he used um, football as a medium to, to, be, to be something bigger. When he passed, yeah, personally, you know, my friend was gone, but also like, the world had lost a great man and I wanted to somehow honor him. I had a picture that he had signed and sent me that I put up on my locker, just to remember him. When Ricky took the field against Iowa State, he turned that memory into a fitting tribute. And the crowd is yelling, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. Now Cavill goes in motion, starts left, goes right, handoff, Ricky Williams over the top, he's in the end zone. The fifth rushing touchdown of the night for Ricky Williams. And Ricky Williams is the new NCAA career rushing touchdown leader as he passes Anthony Thompson. He now has 65 career rushing touchdowns. Even with a heavy heart, Ricky produced a stat line so large, holding the box score required two hands. With Walker's number 37 on his helmet, Ricky carried 37 times for a Texas record 350 yards plus five scores. In two weeks, Ricky had rushed for 668 yards and 11 touchdowns, both NCAA records for consecutive games. With the trip to Dallas up next, Ricky would further honor Doak Walker in the same stadium where he became a legend for SMU. Doak Walker wore number 37. Ricky was wearing number 34. And he actually came and asked us, could I wear number 37 in Doak's honor in the house that Doak built? When he wanted to wear uh, his number, I thought to myself, oh my goodness. I would really hate to be those people on Saturday. There are certain times in your, you know, in your career and in your life when you get a sense that the moment you're in is, is bigger than you. And, uh, and when I put that 37 jersey on, you know, the Heisman Trophy kind of went to the back of my mind. Even winning the game went to the back of my mind. And for me, um, you know, it was, it was an honor to wear that jersey and I wanted to, to, do, to do it justice. The Midway at the State Fair in Texas, just a football toss away from the Cotton Bowl, the site of the 93rd meeting between Texas and Oklahoma. Ricky Williams will wear 37 today. Williams trying to get wide. Ricky Williams, touchdown Texas. And oh, by the way, Ricky Williams just passed Herschel Walker to move into third place on the all-time NCAA rushing list. Ricky Williams. He can really go, folks. Oklahoma lost the gap control, and then it's off to the races. And he's in the end zone. Touchdown, Texas. His second touchdown of the day. On my last touchdown, I kind of pointed to my jersey and, and, and pointed up to Dope to acknowledge that I was honoring him. With, uh, with my performance that, that day. How emotional was this game today? Well, I came out here and, you know, I was, I was proud to wear this number in the house that he built, and, and I think our team did a great job, you know, to let me pay a tribute to him in a, in a very big way. When you went into the end zone on that one touchdown run, you po pointed up to the sky. What was that all about? I knew Doug was watching me and helping me get some yards tonight. I had become friends, or at least familiar, with, uh, with Doug's family. And they were there at the game and, you know, in the locker room with us and kind of peeled off this sweaty, bloody jersey <laughs> and, uh, and handed it to his family for them, for them to keep. You know, they were all teary-eyed and we were, everybody in the room was. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. Following that game against Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl, there were a lot of Heisman voters who began to take a second look, not at Ricky Williams' statistics, but at Ricky Williams, the person. But just as quickly as he returned to the collective vision of Heisman voters, Ricky nearly disappeared for good the next week against Baylor. Applewhite will throw for the first down. Looking right, deep right sideline, has a man, Kamir makes the catch, and he is knocked out of bounds at the 23-yard line. Ricky Williams is hurt. He is hobbling off the field. His right ankle or knee. He is not putting any pressure at all on that right leg. That is not good news, obviously, for Texas. 
When you're a successful football player, you, you do become targeted. I just took off and I came down to the field. The police officer was standing there at the field coming toward me and I just put my hand up. I said, oh, you know I'm going in there. I walk into the locker room area. I just go busting in there and Ricky's eyes get so big and he's like, mom, you can't be in here. And I was like, I just need to know that you're okay. And he's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then he just turns me around and just kind of shoves me out. Well, Ricky Williams is fine and well rested. If a picture paints a thousand words, it looks like the opening gun for Ricky. He came running out of the locker room with his teammates. Texas trailed 13 to eight going into the fourth quarter. But with Ricky back, the game was put on his back. Coach Royal said, dance with the one that brung you. And he did that with Earl Campbell. So um, uh, there wasn't any doubt in our mind when we were in trouble against a good Baylor team, what we had to do was give it to our best player. Usually when you need a big play, coaches tend to go to the two minute offense or throw the ball. And uh, you know, to my, to my pleasure and my surprise, um, Coach Brown gave me the ball. And uh, I basically accomplished what the passing game would have. You're like, damn, we called the same play, not a different run play, the same play about 12 times in a row. We ran it over and over and over again, they couldn't stop it. Absolutely couldn't stop it. The only time they stopped it, they knocked his helmet off. And they threw his helmet and got a 15 yard penalty and extended the drive and they got some more of it. Helmet comes flying off and a flag goes down. That was very ill advised on that play by the Baylor Bears. Hand off to Williams up the middle. 10, 5, to the goal line, to the end zone. Touchdown, Ricky Williams. The Longhorns have regained the lead 22 to 20. A minute later, Ricky scored again. He has the hole. He had carried the ball 39 times despite spending part of the game in the locker room. He had carried his team to the win with 126 rushing yards in the fourth quarter alone. But in Lincoln, Nebraska, Ricky's on-field accomplishments were met with equal parts skepticism and brashness. The black shirts wanted to turn Ricky black and blue. Nebraska's black shirt defense has a trick-or-treat plan for Ricky Williams here. They respect and they admire him. Who doesn't? But the Huskers do not want to let him gain much ground on Tony Dorsett. He needs 444 yards in four games. Pursuit and getting a lot of bodies around people when they're running and, and you know, try to, you know, discourage them as much as you can, you know, that, you know, that this is going to be a tough day. Everybody's going to be headhunting, you know, everybody's want to, you know, take him, take, take him down. I don't think we're going in the game looking to just contain him. I think we're going going in the game looking to shut him down. I'm not worried about it at all. The way I looked at it, in the past, I can go out there and I can be more aggressive than they are, and, and I'm going to make them the target when I get the ball. If Nebraska wasn't inspired before, well, they are now if they saw that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it was, one of those <laughs> it was one of those things that uh, probably just came out. You know, it probably just, just came out. I said, Ricky, what are you doing? Don't stir them up. And he said, oh, coach, they need to understand I'm fully expecting to win the game. People said, you know, don't give any bulletin board material. Why not? Uh, if you're trying to change the attitude of a, of a program and the attitude of this team, it's, it starts with, with your best guy. You are looking live at Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska, where the Cornhuskers have been unbeaten through 47 straight games and the big red machine ready to roll. Nobody really gave Major Applewhite, Ricky Williams, and Texas much of a chance that day. Nebraska will jump all over Williams, and I predict, don't be surprised if Ricky Williams doesn't finish the game. And here's the toss, here's Ricky, short side alley. Williams explodes for 10 more yards. Lost to Ricky Williams, got an alley and explodes into a 25. Look out, got great speed. Out to midfield with Ricky Williams. There are certain moments in a season where you really define yourself as a team. We punched him in the mouth and, and fought back. Williams, left side, muscles his way. He just kept pounding and pounding, and boy, were they all over him. And now it takes three black shirts to bring him down. Texas opened up a 10-0 lead behind 82 first quarter rushing yards from Ricky. But the Huskers countered with 13 straight points. 
and the third quarter, they were close to adding seven more until Ricky made one of the most critical plays of the season. Boy, Texas has had problems with their last five times on third down. This is going to be a tough one. Throw picked off. Brown's got it. Out of the 12 yard. One of my favorite things to do when I was in college was to make tackles. When Major threw a pick and I was kind of running over and they had two or three guys that were blocking and I kind of slid through them and made the tackle on the sideline and uh, saved the touchdown. Just a critical play in terms of playing with, without the football because they weren't going to score offensively on us that day. They weren't. That was the only way they were going to do it through special teams or some kind of defensive touchdown. Ricky's tackle kept points off the board as the Texas defense forced a fumble inside the five. But late in the fourth quarter, Ricky's chance for a signature win depended on a third and 21 play. With Texas down by three, Major Applewhite stepped up in the pocket and hit Brian White, whose left foot kept him in bounds and Texas in the game. With 2.47 left, the fifth longest home winning streak in history was about to be exactly that. To the right, now they send Williams out in motion. That was a piece of our game plan a lot that year, was to motion me out, opening up the field for Major to find a, a crease and the receivers to get open. Apple White's going to throw on third down. We were told never to throw late over the middle, but there was just a, a spot there that Wayne had found, and he made a hell of a play and got underneath the ball with his hands. Tossing! Texas, an upset winner again. They come in to Lincoln and snap a 47-game home winning streak. You know, I thought we had a good chance to win, and the team just believed, and the line did a great job, and, and I wanted to carry the ball. I wanted to be the man today, and I was, and, and I'm so proud of our team right now. After the game's over, we're walking off the field. I put my arm under his, and I said, keep your head down, because people may be rude, and they may be throwing things, because this is, this is a big deal to beat somebody who's won 47 straight home games. You, you've taken something away from them. I noticed, you know, I looked around, and I saw that all the fans were still there. They were giving us a standing ovation. I have never, ever experienced a losing fan base give the winning team, the visitors, a standing ovation. I thought it was one of the classiest performances by a fan base that I'd ever seen. I thought that night's probably the night that he won the Heisman. To go into Lincoln and win when no one had was a, a splash game for Ricky. 150 yards against Nebraska at that time was like 300 yards rushing against anybody else. That solidified the Heisman Trophy for me, for Ricky Williams, and now everything was gravy. Now it was all about can you catch Tony Dorsett's record? Can you become the guy on the top of the mountain of college running backs uh, in history? Ricky was less than 300 yards from the summit, with three games still to play. When we came into the Oklahoma State game the next week, uh, we were very high off of beating uh, Nebraska, and it's a dangerous game. Their game plan, it appears, was Stop number 34 was to stop me uh, at all costs. And if we want to win this game, we're going to have to start throwing the ball a little bit more. Apple White downfield has a man. Touchdown, Texas. This game is unfolding as we thought it might. Oklahoma State gambling and putting their cornerbacks into man coverage against two great receivers. Rob Ryan is the defensive coordinator for Oklahoma State. And he's decided he's going to put 13, 14, or 15 guys on the line of scrimmage and, and stop Ricky Williams and make us throw the ball. Here's the Heisman candidate, and he got rocked in the backfield that time. Oklahoma State had even more help in the form of Sports Illustrated in town for potential cover story on Ricky. It looked as if the jinx had arrived before the cover. Texas led by 10 at the half, thanks to Major Applewhite. But Ricky struggled to gain traction with the Oklahoma State defense shadowing his every move. I remember Coach coming up to me and, and you know, saying, we're going to get you going, we're going to get you going, don't worry about it. And I kind of was thinking to myself, uh, it's actually, it's not working, Coach, so can we try something different, please? He just was matter of fact about it. I mean, he was like, Coach, they're putting them all in there, throw it. Ricky came over to me and said, Coach, don't worry about the Heisman. 
Don't worry about me. Don't worry about the number of yards. Let's just win the football game. And Texas did by exploiting the OSU game plan. Major Applewhite threw for a school record 408 yards, 74 of them to Ricky, his personal best. Oklahoma State held him to 90 yards rushing, but Ricky got 42 of those yards on the final drive of the game, setting up a Chris Stockton game winner. And he got it. Chris Stockton with three seconds to go on the game clock. Oh, it's a magical year in Austin. <laughs> Two wins away from a division title. 204 yards from Dorsett's title. Texas was cover worthy once again. Typically that's kind of a curse, if you will, for somebody to be on the cover of SI. But shoot, we were happy to have him on the cover and happy to have Burn Orange on the cover. It was awesome. I mean, Texas Tornado, that was like perfect. And to see the cover, that was, the mo that was one of the most beautiful sights for me to see that. Curse or coincidence, Texas followed with a heartbreaking loss in Lubbock. While his best friend, Wayne McGarity, set a school record with four touchdown catches, Ricky ran for 141 yards, but was outrushed by his Texas Tech counterpart of the same name. The loss also gave the Big 12 South title to Texas A&M. When you go to Lubbock and play, usually crazy things always happen. And it was one of those games where we started hot and we were putting points on the board, but they were also putting points on the board. And in the end, they, they outlasted us. Things happen the way they're supposed to happen. That record needed to be broken at home in our stadium in front of all of our fans. Ricky was going back to Austin, only 63 yards away from history. The Wrecking Crew defense was the last hurdle, and Ricky was never one to jump over when he could run through. For me, to be a Texas Longhorn means, means tradition. You're always pushed by the people that have played before, and I felt that push the whole time I was here. Ricky Williams' pursuit of history was initially more steady than spectacular. He lined up mostly as a fullback in his first two seasons, unsung and underused. But going into his final home game, the overdue superstar was churning out yards like few before. With 3,758 since the start of his junior season, Ricky needed 63 against Texas A&M to set the record for most rushing yards in a career. Fans in Austin were familiar with the math. At our practice field, there was a big billboard, you know, for the, for the last few weeks of the season that that had, you know, how many yards I needed for the record. So I was very aware of how many yards I needed. I know I was driving down, I believe it was 35, and I saw the billboard and almost ran off the road. The whole town was kind of crazy, you know, during that week. Ricky came up to me during practice and said, I'm going to get the 60 plus, so I'm not worried about that, but uh, it's about 275 yards to break the all-time, all-purpose record. And he said, could you let me return a kickoff or two? Coach had a little grin on his face, and he said, I'll get that record too. And I said, let's worry about the 60 plus and beating A&M. Let's quit worrying about Napoleon McCallum's all-time, all-purpose record. To become the best, Ricky would need to run through the best. Texas A&M was ranked sixth nationally. The Wrecking Crew was the second ranked defense in America, and Dad Wynn was arguably the best linebacker in the college game. Ricky was going for the record. He wanted that record. There was a chance he was going to break the record. So we, as a group, collectively said that we did not want Ricky Williams to set that record in that game. You are looking at the countdown billboard alongside Interstate 35 in Austin, Texas. Ricky Williams is within 63 yards of Tony Dorsett's all-time rushing record. The weather, perfect. The track, lightning fast. It's Texas A&M and Texas, yes, it is run, Ricky, run for the Horns. But for the Aggies, it's win, dead win. When you walked on the field for warm-ups that day, there was just some electricity. Tony Dorsett was there. There was just so much hype. Ricky also told me before the game that, Coach, I'm not going to break the record on a short run. I'm going to get me an ESPN special run. It's going to be a long one uh, that'll be on the highlights that night. It'll be in the ESPN highlights. It's one of the greatest plays ever. I said, hey, worry about winning the game. Worry about getting your 60-plus yards. Don't start telling me how you're going to do it. 
I mean, it was just like, when is he going to do it, you know? Because we're damn sure going to give him enough carries to break 62 yards. Five men along that defensive front all looking in at number 34. He doesn't disappoint. He's got room to the outside. 40, 35, and smashed out of bounds. That's 14 more yards for Ricky Williams. He needs only 40 yards now. Here he comes again, steps into the hole. It's down to 31. Here comes Ricky, pounds to the middle, and the number continues to fall. In less than 13 minutes, Ricky had 52 yards. The record that Tony Dorsett held for 22 years was slipping through his hands like Ricky through the wrecking crew. A national TV audience collectively inched closer to the TV and asked when and how. Major Applewhite answered the former for all to see. I looked back at Daryl Drake, our wide receiver coach, and kind of gave him like, maybe this is it, you know? Because, uh, you know, we were all wanting to see it happen. Did you see the confidence? Did you see that wink? I remember looking up at the, at the jumbotron and seeing that I needed 11 yards. And somehow I just knew that this was going to be the play. Brown is the lead back for Ricky. Offsets it a little bit to the left. 11 yards shy of the record. Williams breaks a hole. Williams, hello, record book. Ricky Williams runs to the Hall of Fame, cuts back. Ricky Williams, touchdown! 60 yards, and the record is his. He does it in dramatic fashion. And a standing ovation for the king of the rushers. I can see that flow toward the play, and I just got low on him. I can remember taking on the lead block by Ricky Brown, and then I looked up, all I could see was camera flashes. <laughs> I remember right getting the ball, and I remember seeing Kwame come back and crack the safety, and he left the corner. And I just kind of got low you know, with the reaction enough, so he bounced off, and then I kind of popped in the open field. When I saw him break through the initial you know, crowd on the field, I was like, oh, he has it. And then that's when I'm jumping up and down, and I'm like, I'm running with him. And so I'm running up the sideline, and I'm thinking, uh, I was looking for that, you know, that sixth gear, and I couldn't find it, so I was like, uh-oh. And just as I thought that, I see my, uh, my good buddy Wayne coming over to make a block. I knew I had a chance to get over there in front of him and make a block for him so that he could get into the end zone. I crossed the end zone. It was, it just was amazing, you know. I just, I could feel the electricity in me and in the whole stadium that I, I just did it, and I did it in a big way, scoring a 60-yard touchdown. Run. I was excited. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was proud. I wanted to share it with my teammates, and it just was a, an awesome moment that I felt I shared with with the entire stadium. I thought it was one of the most spectacular, record-breaking performances that we've ever seen in any sport. I was thinking that it was good that we got it out of the way, and then all of a sudden I felt like that uh, now we can go play because the record's not going to mean near as much to Ricky and our team and our fans unless we beat Texas A&M today. The horns were riding the emotional train of history made. Ricky was the engine, and he was full speed ahead. And I fumbled. Remember, Ricky Williams was not even the featured back for the first couple of years as he gets still another carry. Fumble, and has got it. Aggies recover it. One play after the record. Ricky coughs it up. Usually when you fumble, the coach isn't smiling, but uh, Coach Brown had a smile on his face, and he said, yeah, you broke the record, but you still got to play. <laughs> I take those fumbles with a grain of salt. You know, he could fumble it eight more times that game. It wasn't going to matter. But the Aggies took advantage of those miscues, scoring 17 fourth quarter points. And McCown has got it. And the Aggies will go for one in the lead. Ricky was leaving as the all-time leader in rushing, and it also bettered Napoleon McCallum's record for all-purpose yards. But with two minutes and 12 seconds left, he needed three points to leave as a winner. Major Applewhite took control, directing Texas from its 23 to the A&M 14 with 17 seconds left. Major Applewhite, the redshirt freshman, calmly leading the Longhorns right down the field against the Aggies. 
Ricky then carried the ball for the final time in Austin. His stiff arm was both prophetic and important. It allowed Chris Stockton to make it triumphant. This for a whole season of bragging, one way or the other. And Stockton nails it. And the Horns win it. The Horns hook their arch rival. The man of the day, the season, and the last couple of years is Ricky Williams. That was the last time that we're going to play in front of that crowd in that stadium. My feeling was a little bit of sadness that that was it. I felt like I could have stayed at Texas playing football for the rest of my life. And, you know, that, that, that chapter was coming to an end. When I walked out of the stadium, I said, ship the Heisman to Austin. There was never a doubt who I was going to vote for. It was Ricky Williams 1, Ricky Williams 2, and Ricky Williams 3. I don't think I was allowed to say it, but I knew I had won the Heisman Trophy after that game. If Ricky Williams had not won the Heisman that year after the numbers he put up, which over a career made him one of the greatest college football players of all time, they should have just shut the Heisman Award down. I was really confident in New York that, that Ricky would win the Heisman. And you can usually tell uh, there's a, a, a different reception when your guy's going to win. <laughs> and I'm sure they don't do it on purpose, but they're smiling and laughing and grabbing your hand and welcome, coach, glad you're here. The other time, they're, it's, it's pretty professional and pretty businesslike. I missed all kind of clues. We got picked up from the airport in a limo. They interviewed myself and Rick's two sisters, and they didn't interview the other parents, but I was so tunnel vision blind to that. I, I missed it all. If they pick you up in a limo and everyone else has to take a taxi, um, that was a pretty clear sign to me. I didn't really look for clues because we didn't talk about the Heisman at all. We just talked about how cool it was to be in New York and you know being treated so well. It was amazing. It was it was New York um, in December, and so you get the, the chilly weather, um, you get the lights, and you get New York. And I remember walking into the room and some you know, they tell me my seats up front, and as I'm walking, I'm seeing Marcus Allen, and I'm seeing all these these football greats, and there was something awesome, something amazing about the Downtown Athletic Club. It was unreal. It was, everything was just kind of a blur. And I remember sitting down and they started the ceremony. In less than an hour, this famous fraternity welcomes a new man. And as is custom, many of the former winners have shown up to welcome him and also to share in some memories. We've got Earl Campbell, the Tyler Rose, which wouldn't mind a bit sharing this club with another Longhorn running back. Tony Dorsett, until recently, the rushing king. He's gotten caught up in the fun of the record chase himself. Tonight is a salute to the seasons and the careers of all four Heisman finalists. Tim Couch, Kentucky's tall trigger man, the only non-senior among the top four. That is a rarity. Quarterback Michael Bishop, the tremendous talent who's led Kansas State into college football's elite. Cade McNown, the driving force behind what was a 20-game winning streak for UCLA. And Ricky Williams, capped off an unsurpassed career with a 2,000-yard senior season while carrying the weight of the Heisman favorite with ease. Please congratulate all of our 1998 Heisman Trophy finalists. I watched it at the facility with the rest of the team, just watching them up there, nervous. And they're gathering down in Austin, Texas. The Longhorn teammates certainly expecting to unleash in a celebration in a very short time. I told him about halfway through the ceremony, I said, get yourself ready to win, because I just have a great feeling about this. There's no question to us that Ricky Williams is the best football player in America. We needed to raise our level of coaching and play to Ricky's level. My mind kept going back the year before when everyone just knew for sure that Peyton Manning was going to win, and then um, Woodson won. I remember the look on Peyton Manning's family's face and I just wasn't going to be that person on TV. You just don't know until you hear the name. Without further delay, the Downtown Athletic Club is proud to award the 1998 Heisman Memorial Trophy to Ricky Williams of the University <laughs> My first thought was, I can't believe this is really happening. It was like a party. I mean, and seeing them announce his name and him go down and, and, and 
He actually gave credit to us, you know. It was a really special moment. It was a jubilation. We all felt like, you know, we had just won the Heisman Trophy too. I don't even remember what the emotions were. I just remember that I was standing up there at a podium delivering a speech. Well, first of all, I want to say it's, um, it's an honor and a pleasure to me to be uh, in front of such, you know, great football players past and, uh, and present. Um, I got to give a thanks and glory to God because without him, I would not be here. A matter of fact, on a Thanksgiving, um, I woke up that morning um, and I, I gave thanks and I sat there for about an hour and a half because I had so much to give thanks for. And, uh, I think that's great. Um, and I, you know, give praise to these, these three great quarterbacks right here. Uh, as everyone saw, um, you know, I, I got a chance to, to watch two of these guys and they, they tore right through our defense. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, Texas has a lot to do with these two guys being here. And, uh, I think I, I owe the, the greatest amount of gratitude to my teammates. I mean, all the guys back home watching, thanks guys so much. I mean, I decided to come back and the, the main reason was for you guys because I, I couldn't leave you guys like that. I mean, growing up, I, I never really dreamed of playing, you know, in, in NFL, but I did dream of playing college football and, and my teammates made everything, you know, just this super. When he told me, Coach, I'm coming back to make sure that we get Texas football headed back in the right direction, by all of his accomplishments that year, and especially by winning the Heisman Trophy, that's exactly what he did. When you're a kid, they tell you anything that you want in life, you can achieve it if you want it bad enough. So it was just one of those moments where, instead of that being like a philosophical point of view, it actually was a reality. So it was special.